Hey, welcome. Today we're going to be talking about where the period of a pendulum equation comes from. This is primarily for AP Physics students, and you should know where this equation comes from, and possibly you'll need to know how to derive this equation. So I'm going to show you how to derive this equation and how to think through this. And once we go through the derivation, it'll make more sense to say that this equation works for very small angles. And let me show you what's going on here. So if we have a pendulum like this over here, if you think about the forces that are involved, there's a tension force going along the length of the string or the rope, and there's a force due to gravity going down, and there's a restoring force as well. This we'll call FGT for tangential direction of the component of the force due to gravity. That really is the force that's going to drive this back towards the equilibrium position. All right, so let's think about this plane right here and think about the sum of the forces that are happening here. The main force in this axis right here in the tangential axis is just that mg sine theta. That's going to be this fgt value over here. And we have to treat this as negative at this point in the equation and working this out because this is always going to be pointing in the direction opposite that of the displacement from the equilibrium position. So it's very important that we keep track of that. The same is true for Hooke's law, for instance, as well. All right, so then we know that we can use the sum of the forces strategy, what I call that, and we say, well, that sum of the forces in that axis is also equal to mass times acceleration. That's Newton's second law. And then we can go ahead and set these equal to each other. So we do that. The masses go away, and we're left with this so far. And next, we need to recall for simple harmonic motion, we can say acceleration is going to be equal to negative omega squared x in simple harmonic motion. I've done another screencast I'll put a link to in the upper right right about now that'll help you to understand why we can say that is the case. But for now we're going to say that's the case, so we go ahead and sub in that value for a, and this is what we're left with. I'm going to go ahead and switch the sides of the equation, just preference and get rid of the negative signs as well and we're left with this equation right here. All right now this x value is a little confusing really what we want is more of an arc length than an x because the motion right here is an arc length it's not a true x value so to do that what we're going to say is let's change that x into an s and we know that s is equal to r times theta that is on our equation sheet for ap physics c mechanics students and so we're going to go ahead and change that out and the other thing that we can say about this at this point is that r this r value right here is actually the length of the pendulum. So that makes sense. So we're going to go ahead and change that for an L value. And next up we need to remember what is omega squared equal to? Well one way of looking at omega is we can say well that's 2 pi over a period. And so we can sub in that omega value here and we will square it. There is one really important thing that we need to talk about as well and this is an important concept and that is there is something called a small angle approximation. At small angles, like let's say under 15 degrees, an angle in radians and the sine of that angle in radians are basically the same. They're not exactly the same, but they're pretty close that you can actually approximate and call them the same. This is crucial for our derivation, and it does pop into problems from time to time. So what we're going to do is run with that assumption, and I will come back to this and give you an example of what I'm talking about. But we're going to use the small angle approximation here and algebraically, if we can say that theta is equal to sine theta, that they are basically the same, that means we can cancel them out and be left with this at this point right here. So now I'm running out of room. I'm going to get rid of the small angle approximation notation I have here. But we're going to continue to take what we have here and try to algebraically change it into the period of a pendulum equation. So we want to solve for period here. Let's go ahead and distribute the squared function right here and then start to isolate for a period. And so we do that and we end up with the period of a pendulum equation. And now it makes sense to say this holds true at small angles. If you start to have angles that are too large, then this no longer holds true. Now, I made the claim that at small angles, the sine of an angle in radians is basically the same as that angle. So let me show you what I'm talking about right here. So addressing that claim that at small angles, sine of theta is approximately equal to theta. Let's change, say, 10 degrees into radians. So 10 degrees would equal 0 0.175 radians. And let's take the sine of that. That ends up being 0 0.174. So notice 
that 0 0.175 is approximately equal to 0 0.174. You can see that this assumption is actually pretty solid. Even up to 10 or 15 degrees, you still have a very small difference between these two values. It really only is if you start getting above, say, 30 degrees, that it becomes more significant. And that's it. So hopefully this has been helpful. If you have any comments down below, please let me know, and I hope you all have a great day. Take care.